Here's how to get a perfect score on the math section of the SAT. Number one, instead of memorizing formulas, concentrate on grasping the principles. While memorizing is vital, understanding how and why the topics are applied on the SAT is crucial. For example, let's say we have this practice exam question. If X and Y are positive integers, is X, Y even? The choices being X is even and Y is even, X is even and Y is odd, X is odd and Y is even, and X is odd and Y is odd. To answer this question, we don't even need to memorize a form. Instead, we just need to know the concept of even and odd numbers. We know that an even number is divisible by 2 and an odd number is not. Therefore, if both x and y are even, then x, y would be even because the product of two even numbers is going to be an even number. Yes, I know this example is very simple, but it illustrates a very important point about the SAT, which is that a lot of the questions on the math section particularly are logic-based. As long as you use common sense to deduct the correct answer, you'll be very well off in a lot of cases. Number two is simple, practice. The more types of questions that you see and the more questions that you solve, the more you will feel at ease when it comes time to actually take the exam. Let's take this practice question. A bag contains five red marbles, three green marbles, and four blue marbles. If a marble is chosen at random from the bag, what is the probability that the marble will be either red or green? So once again, the sample question is very simple. All you have to do is take the number of desired outcomes and divide it by the number of total outcomes, which comes out to be five plus three over 12 or two thirds. The question is simple, but take it from this perspective. Let's say you were someone that was taking the SAT for the very first time in comparison to someone who took multiple practice exams and has already taken the exam two times. This type of question was likely seen by the latter at least a couple of times during the times that he practiced the practice exams as well as on the actual exam. Which means, since he knows the type of problem that this is and the structure that it's asking for, he'll take less time to figure out what the question needs and how to answer the problem, as opposed to the first time test taker, who needs to read the question, maybe even read it a second time to make sure that he's reading it correctly, and then go through the process of solving the problem. Yes, I know this problem is simple, but it might only be simple because you've already seen this type of question so many times. The moral of the story is, Practice. The more familiar you are with the questions, the better your outcome will be. And also very importantly, you get to save a lot of time. Now the third tip is to learn to spot and remove incorrect response options. You'll save time and have a better shot of getting the proper response if you do this. Let's take this practice question. If x plus y equals 7 and x minus y equals 3, what is the value of x? 5, 6, 7, or 8. You can find x using the following equations. We can deduce them from the first equation that x is equal to 7 minus y. Then we deduce from the second equation that x is equal to 3 plus y. Then we put these two together and we have 7 minus y equals 3 plus y, which is reduced to 4 equals 2y, which is reduced again to y equals 2. Thus, we go back to the original equation, we plug it in, and we find that y is equal to 5. Now, this particular tip, number 3, would not particularly be applicable to this practice question. But let's say we had some outlandish number. Let's say one of the options was 55. There would be almost no shot that with such small numbers like these and a simple x plus y and an x minus y equation, the answer could possibly be 55. So if you do see some sort of outlandish number, eliminate it immediately. Just like with the second tip, the point is not to answer the question, but to save time. Because the more time that you have for the questions that are at the end of the SAT, which tend to be a lot more difficult, one, you feel more at ease, and two, it takes a lot of pressure off of you which leads to less mistakes. So whenever you have the opportunity to eliminate any of the choices, do it immediately. And lastly, number five, arguably the most interesting tip. Look closely at the words that are used in the question. The SAT frequently uses terms like always or never to lead test takers to select the wrong response. Make sure to thoroughly study the questions and pay attention to the words of this nature. For example, let's take a look at this practice question. If x is an integer, is x plus 2 an odd number? A, always, B, never, C, sometimes, and D, no, if x is odd. Now, once again, I picked a very easy and simple question to illustrate this tip. And obviously, you're probably not going to see something as simple as this. But it gets the job. Very simple. The answer is almost always not going to be always or never. On standardized tests like the SAT, Choices with terms like always or never or any other form of absolute language is frequently going to be used by the test makers as traps. The test authors frequently provide answer options that are not genuinely always or never true in order to deceive test takers into selecting the incorrect response. Despite the fact that these answers indicate a clear answer, this is done to guarantee that the test is difficult and the students must carefully consider each response before choosing one instead of just blindly selecting always or never in the hopes that the case is always or never. Keeping it simple. Let me know if you have any other questions. I'm out.